Tonight we're in chapter 19 here, and this is an, a, a lamentation, a song of sorrow. And so we'll begin reading here in verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 19, a lamentation. Beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4, Ezekiel writes, Moreover, take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel, and say, What is your mother? A lioness. She lay down among the lions. Among the young lions she nourished her cups, cubs. She brought up one of her cubs, and he became a young lion. He learned to catch prey, and he devoured men. The nations also heard of him. He was trapped in their pit, and they brought him with chains to the land of Egypt. Chapter 19, a song of sorrow. The word lamentation speaks of sorrow. And so what he's saying is, I have a song of sorrow that I'm about to, to write down for you. And, and what this particular song of sorrow, this lamentation deals with, is really basically three of the kings from Judah. Remember with me that Israel originally was made up of a single nation consisting of 12 tribes. But a king by the name of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, had created a problem right after his father had died. And as a result, the 12 tribes that consisted of the single nation of Israel were divided into two segments. You had it divided into what was called the 10 northern tribes, and then you had what is referred to as the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. This particular lamentation is written concerning the kings of the south, Judah. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing a lamentation over the, the kings of Judah. In particular, what we'll be seeing is three kings that are being spoken about in this particular passage. You, you have a king, and we'll look at them briefly. You have a king by the name of Jeho Jehoahaz. You have a second one by the name of Jehoiachin. And you have the third one that will be seen by the name of Zedekiah. And so basically what this is going to deal with is, is, is captivity of the first two kings that I mentioned. And then you're going to see the collapse of David's kingdom through Zedekiah. So verses 1 through 4, as I just read, refer to a, a king by the name of Jehoahaz. And, and Jehoahaz ultimately had been taken and exiled in a, an Egyptian prison. Verses 5 through 9, we'll be speaking of Jehoiachin, who was exiled in Babylon. And so that's what we're looking at. So he says in verse 1, Moreover, take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel and say, What is your mother, a lioness, she lay down among the lions. Among the young lions, she nourished her cubs. And so, she speaks, he speaks of the, the symbol of Judah. You need to know that a lion is the symbol of the nation of Judah. If you take notes, you see that in the Old Testament book of Genesis in chapter 49, verse 9, where it says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? And so this picture here, when it's, it says, uh, what is your mother, a lioness, is a picture of Judah. And she's a, a royal or a regal lion. And as a, a regal lion, Judah had taken her place securely among her neighbors. It speaks of her cubs. Her cubs were actually her descendants, the descendants of the house of David. But what happened to them is they were exposed to the corruption of evil kings, the pagan kings. And so... I want to develop this with you for just a moment here. The kings of Israel, as we've been studying in the book of 1 Samuel, the kings of Israel were intended to rule in a righteous fashion. And they were to use the word of God as the way that they were established in their rule. Remember in Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verses 18 and 19, it says this, It shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. As I've been saying to you, remember we have a king, the first king of Israel, a man by the name of Saul, 
And it wasn't that God was opposed to Israel having a king. It was how they went about selecting one. God had given to them in the Old Testament law the rule of kings and even warnings concerning them. So it wasn't that he did not expect to ultimately have a king because he knew that he'd have his son Jesus who was king over Israel. But the kings who were to rule were to rule in a certain way and the kings were to rule according to his word. So there was to be righteous rule and there was to be justice that was done. You see, if the king ruled according to the word of God, justice would prevail and the people would prosper. The king's rule would be marked by justice and righteousness because the king was holding fast to God's word. So he was to be very careful not to be influenced in his rule by personal experience alone. He was to be influenced through his thinking. He was to be molded in his knowledge by the word of God so that he could rule with righteousness and justice. It wasn't just that he was going to be well-trained. It wasn't going to be that he was simply eloquent and articulate. It wasn't that he was going to be learned in all the wisdom that was to be offered to him that the world had to offer. He was to be molded by the word of God. When you think of people who are very important in the history of Israel, you can't help but think of a man by the name of Moses. Moses was somebody who, uh, who was born to slaves there in Egypt. And because a pharaoh had arisen who didn't remember Joseph, this particular pharaoh made a determination that all the boys that were being born to these uh, Jewish women were to be put to death. We know the story of Moses. We know how that he was hidden and how that the daughter of Pharaoh had found him and how that she raised him as her own. We also know by looking into the book of Acts that this is a man who is described as being learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Moses was an individual who was eloquent and had a lot of knowledge. He was somebody who was raised to be a pharaoh. So he had everything going for him. He had the highest form of education that could be afforded a young man. And so that's why at the age of 40, when he saw an Egyptian who was harming one of his brethren according to the flesh, who was harming a Jewish man, that's why Moses, when he saw this taking place, got so upset. And that's why he looked to the left and he looked to the right and then promptly went and slew the Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. The reason he was able to do that, and we need to keep this in its context, when you read that, it says that he looked to the left and he looked to the right, and then he killed him and buried him. We're failing to understand something about what was going on in the heart of Moses. Moses was somebody that was trained in all the wisdom and knowledge of the Egyptians. Moses, and this is something you, wouldn't, you would naturally not think about, but this is something you'd have to know. Moses was a trained military fighter. That's what he was. He was a real-life Rambo. This was a guy who was for real. I mean, he had no fear of this Egyptian taskmaster. So when he saw the taskmaster who was abusing a fellow Israelite, it doesn't say anywhere that Moses thought about it for a second because, you see, those taskmasters were amongst the biggest and baddest men that Egypt had to offer because they were there to keep the slaves in line. These were not little thin guys running around. These were bad dudes, and they were heavily, heavily armed. Moses didn't even think for a moment about that. It doesn't show in Scripture that he even gave it a second thought. He simply looked to the left and the right. Nobody's looking, he thought, and he killed him. He was a martial artist. This was a man who was learned in every way that a man could be learned. He was educated, he was eloquent, he was absolutely bad, but he wasn't ready to be a ruler or deliverer because he used the arm of the flesh. And that's why he was banished to the backside of the desert where he got his B.D. degree, backside of the desert. And he spent 40 years there. He had to unlearn the things that he had learned so that he could know that, that if deliverance was going to come, it was going to come through God. He had to learn that because he knew that he was to be the deliverer of Israel. That is made very clear in the book of Acts, chapter 7. He knew it, but he had to unlearn the things that he had learned, the things that he had learned in the world in order that he might learn to rest and rely on God. And it was to Moses that God gave the law, and it was through Moses that the rule of kings was given to the nation of Israel. And the kings 
were to rule through the Word of God, not through just their personal training and life experiences, but through what God's Word has to say. That was to formulate everything that was within them as they made decisions as it related to their rule, you see. To be a king meant to know the Word of God. To be a king meant that your thinking was to be molded by your knowledge of the Word of God. Now, I was thinking this just today. I'll make this very brief. I've been thinking of it recently. I have a, sometimes when I'm teaching, I have a habit of doing something that I have to put a stop to. And that is talking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of you saying, no, oh, my prayers have been answered. No. Um, and that is, there are times that I'll say, and perhaps you've heard me say this, I'll say something like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm just an old man, what do I know? And, uh, and sometimes when I'm saying that, it can come across like, you know, I come from a different time, I come from a different generation, I come from a different way of thinking, and I'm just not up to snuff with what's taking place today. I'm not up to speed. And I really ought to stop saying that because that's really not how my opinions are formed. And I think that sometimes people can think that, especially those who are younger than me. They may think, well, yeah, you represent an older generation. You're from that hippie generation and all. We don't relate to that at all. But the bottom line is, I, I was thinking about it today, and I thought I'd address it for just a moment. The bottom line is, very simply put, my views that I hold have been molded not by the culture that I live in, though I, I do live in this culture and I'm well aware of it. I'm in the world, even as Jesus said, you're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. I live in this world, but I don't want to be molded by this world. I'm not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of my mind, according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm not to be conformed to this world, put into its mold, I'm to be transformed by the Word of God, you see. And so for 38 years, I've been a Christian. I was saved at the age of 20. Two-thirds of my life, almost two-thirds of my life, have been lived following Christ. 38, almost 39 years. I've been in the ministry teaching the Word of God for 35 years, 36 years in September. So for 36 years in September of my life, I've been teaching the Bible. For 38 years, almost 39, I've been reading it. And so my, my, my opinions and, and, and the way that I, I think is a result not of watching TV or reading People magazine. And it's not the result of going to, to university or college. My thinking has been molded and shaped by reading and studying the Word of God. And so that's how I view the world, through that particular lens, if you will. So when I'm watching the news or when I'm reading a newspaper or, or I hear some music on the radio, you know, there are times that I'll, I'll speak out loud and, and my kids can tell you that. They don't like to watch TV with me, though every one of them do the same thing. They learned it from me. I'll watch the news and I'll turn to Marie. Actually, nobody has to even be in the room. I just do it automatically to myself. And I'll think, that's nonsense. Or I'll think, that's not true. I'll say it out loud. I'll say, how bizarre is that? That's not true. Now my kids will say, Dad, can't you suspend yourself for just a moment and just listen? And I'll go, no, I can't. I haven't the capacity to do that. But, Dad, if you're going to enjoy this show, you've got to shut up. No. <laughs> I, I can't. I'll, I'll listen to 90% of it, but, but, yeah, I'll be saying, are you kidding me? That's not true. Where'd you come up with that? I actually argue with those things because that's how I'm trained. I can't help it. I can't help it. I just listen. You know, that's why when somebody comes and says something to me that is scripturally not solid, I don't say anything. I'm not going to sit there and debate point by point with that person, but if they ask me... I'll tell them, no, I disagree with that, and this is the reason why, because this Bible verse says this, and it's helped me to understand that. So, sometimes, especially those of you who might be a bit younger, 
may think that when I come up and I give something and I share something, you know, that's just your opinion. You have an opinion. I have an opinion. In many ways, that's very true, of course. Of course. But what is it that has influenced you in your life that has enabled you to form those opinions? What is the grid that you have in your life that strains out the things that are unacceptable? And how long have you had that grid? How developed is it? And how experienced are you in straining out these things? And what happens is when you're in the Word of God, you start thinking differently. You, you, stop, you stop saying, oh, yeah, I can see how you can do that. You start saying, but you know, God has an answer for that. God has a way to deal with that. And that's what the kings were supposed to do. They weren't supposed to just be kings and, and acquire a lot of land and a lot of servants and a lot of money. And No, they were to be rulers in righteousness because they had the Word of God firmly implanted in their hearts so that when they were ruling there under God's authority, they were representing the kingdom of God on earth. And that's how it was supposed to be. But what happened is we have seen it, and we're seeing it with Saul. Saul was a disobedient king, and there were generations, there was king after king after king that didn't care about the Word of God, that didn't care about the things of God, just like there are people today who don't care about the things of God. They, they, they're not interested in, in the Word of God at all. But the Bible makes it very clear that it's God's Word that helps us to understand how to make decisions. In, in Psalm chapter 1, Psalms 1, verses 1 through 4, listen to what the psalmist says. In Psalm 1, verses 1 through 4, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. They have no stability. They have no roots. They have no firmness. They have no foundation. A man who is in the Word of God, a woman who's in the Word of God is, is like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. And as those roots go deeply into it, they have a source, of, a continual source of nourishment. And as a result of that, they grow and they're healthy and they produce fruit. But the ungodly are not so. Their lives are dry and they're easily driven by the winds of opinion and the world. See, so I was sharing on Monday with the uh, 1835 group, I was sharing with them that my desire has been to be very, very much used by God, to be used by the Lord, to, to know His ways and to know His Word and, and, and simply to, to live a life that is progressively sold out to God. And I really believe that should the Lord tarry, one of these days, you know, and who knows when, but one of these days, should Jesus tarry, I'm not going to make it to this pulpit. I won't be here anymore. I'll be with him. I'll be seeing his face. That's what my life's all about. That's what it's all about for me, is to one day see him, to one day be with him. But right now, right now in one of, our, in one of the children's ministry rooms, there may be the next pastor of Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, being trained by a Sunday school teacher right now. They may be there right now learning the ways of the Lord and one day they'll be in this pulpit. I don't know that, that that's not going to happen. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you that I'm handing over the, uh, a Bible study, the SOS, basically, the Song of Solomon study, the 1835 study. I'm going to be handing it over to a young man. He's going to be doing some ministry. And um, this young man was born while his mother and dad were attending this church. I remember his mom pregnant with him. Noreen Callahan, Mike Callahan is their son Michael. I remember Noreen pregnant with Michael. 
Michael's 24 years old now. Michael's gotten his degree out of Cal State Fullerton in communications. He's, he's taken a master's degree in Talbot School of Theology. I have seen this young man from, from the time that his mom was pregnant with him, and now I'm handing him a Bible study. It happens. These things do happen. Where you see somebody grow up in the umbrella of a ministry to take a position of service because they're qualified by God, because their life has been blessed by God, anointed by God. They've been trained in the things of God all of their life. And that's what I'd like to see for all of us in one form or another. Getting serious with the things of the Lord and being used mightily by God. And I have this, this phrase, why not? Why not you? Why can't you be used by God? What's holding you back? Why can't you be used by the Lord? What's keeping you from being used by the Lord? Is it worth it? Whatever is keeping you from it isn't worth it. Follow the Lord with all of your heart. You see, the kings were to know the things of God, and they were to rule in a righteous fashion. Unfortunately, they didn't all do that. Unfortunately, the kings of Judah were influenced, even as this passage is saying, by the pagan kings surrounding them. And as a result, they were corrupted. They didn't rule righteously, and they were judged by God. And the first one being mentioned here is Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz was the son of a righteous king by the name of Josiah. Josiah began to rule when he was eight years old. And his son Jehoahaz was not, he was not a righteous man. And he, was, he became evil, and his evil actions actually caught the attention of neighboring nations. And eventually what happens is Egypt dealt with him. It says again in verse 3, she brought up one of her cubs. This speaks of Jehoahaz. He became a young lion. He learned to catch prey. He devoured men. The nations also heard of him. He was trapped in their pit, and they brought him with chains to the land of Egypt. So what happened is as he was only ruling for three months and ultimately was taken captive to Egypt in 608 B.C. According to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 34, Pharaoh took Jehoahaz, went to Egypt, and he died there. That's what's being spoken of in the first four verses. Verse 5, when she saw that she waited, that her hope was lost, she took another of her cubs and made him a young lion. He roved among the lions and became a young lion. He learned to catch prey. He devoured men. He knew their desolate places and laid waste their cities. The land with its fullness was desolated by the noise of his roaring. Then the nations set against him from the provinces on every side and spread their net over him. He was trapped in their pit. They put him in a cage with chains and brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him in nets that his voice should no longer be heard on the mountains of Israel. So this speaks of Jehoiachin. He was 18 years old when he began to rule as the king, but he was unjust and he was oppressive. And as it says, he was taken captive to Babylon. You see that in 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 8 through 15. What's interesting is when you look at this, and it's, he's being described, notice how verse 7 says, he knew their desolate places and laid waste their cities. Uh, that can also be translated, he learned to make widows. That would be another way of, of showing how evil this one was. And what happened to him? Well, verse 9 tells us that they put him in a cage with chains and they brought him to the king of Babylon. Now, what's interesting about this when it says they put him in a cage with chains, the cage that you're speaking of was, was a cage that they used to put lions in or dogs. So they actually put him in a, in a, in a, in a kennel-like, in a pen. And that's how they treated this king. And when it speaks about him actually being uh, with a net over him, they put him in a cage with chains and brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him in nets. That word net, it's interesting. When you read your Bible and, you know, and you see the word net there, yeah, the word can be translated net, but it's also translated hooks. And all you need to do is do a little reading concerning the cruelty of the Babylonian and Assyrian kings, and you get an understanding of what was taking place here. 
They actually would put hooks in the noses of their prisoners. There are, um, there are works of, of what, what, it's not really called art, but there are, there are pictures of, of prisoners that have been taken captive by the Assyrians, and they have chains, but the chains are, are hooked to nose rings. And what they did is they put this nose ring in the nose of their prisoner with the chain attached to it, and it was a way of humiliating them and leading them around. One particular Assyrian king spoke of a king that he had taken. He said, and I use him as a watchdog. I have him chained at the front gate like a dog. And that's what they would do to their prisoners. And that's what happened to him. He had a hook placed in his nose, and he was, he was taken prisoner and placed in a kennel that, that a dog would remain in. Now, he was released, by the way, 37 years later at the age of 55, and according to 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 27 through, through 30, he was treated kindly at that point in his life. But, but 37 years later, he was not able to go back and actually rally any support as a king, and so, so he, he lost all of his usefulness. But that's what happens to him. And then finally, in verse 10, your mother was like a vine in your bloodline planted by the waters, fruitful and full of branches because of many waters. She had strong branches for scepters of rulers. She towered in stature above the thick branches and was seen in her height amid the dense foliage. But she was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground, and the east wind dried her fruit. Her strong branches were broken and withered. The fire consumed them. And now she's planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land. Fire has come out from a rod of her branches and devoured her fruit so that she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. This is a lamentation and has become a lamentation. This would be speaking of Zedekiah. When it says your mother was like a vine, well, Judah would be his mother. A vine is also a symbol of Israel. We saw that in, in uh, chapter 15. And so Judah had every advantage of growth and did grow. And from Judah came mighty kings. And when you look at the lineage and the line of kings, you can see that though not every king of Judah was a righteous king, some were very evil, they had a great number of wonderful kings, powerful kings. You had David and you had Solomon. You had Asa and, and Jehoshaphat. You had King Josiah. There were various kings that were good kings, and that's what's being spoken of. But ultimately what happened is, is they ignored and then forgot God and, and, and God brought his judgment and he did so, according to verse 12, he did so with great fury. Because of the ungodliness of Zedekiah, who is being referred to here, they went into exile in 586. In Jeremiah 38, verses 23 and 24, Jeremiah told Zedekiah, you shall not escape from their hand. You shall not escape from Babylon's hand, but shall be taken uh, by the hand to the king of Babylon. And you shall cause this city to be burned with fire. Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, let no one know of these words and you shall not die. So Jeremiah said, this is what's going to take place, but Zedekiah didn't want to hear it. Ultimately, Zedekiah was taken into captivity and he died in captivity. And that's what he's speaking about here. But I want to close with a couple of thoughts. Notice how it says in verse 14, fire has come out from the rod of her branches, which speaks of Zedekiah, and devoured her fruit, so that she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. This is a lamentation and has become a lamentation. This is where we're going to end, but I want to spend a few moments talking to you about this. I want you to notice that Ezekiel closes by making it clear that this, he says, is a lamentation. But you need to remember something. This song of sorrow is not a song of sorrow coming from the heart of Ezekiel. The song of sorrow, this lamentation, this song of sorrow, comes out of the heart of God. It's actually the Lord God weeping over the princes of Judah because they didn't care for his ways. It's actually God crying 
over the condition of his people. Because his people don't really care. Every once in a while, every once in a while I have people who will talk to me and they'll share with me and they'll say, you know, I know somebody who does children's ministry in, in, in their church. And on, they said, I've, I've been with them on Saturday nights. We've gone out together. And they've said, and you know, and, and they're there drinking. They're getting drunk. And then the next day, they're out there singing songs to the children in children's ministry. What do you think, Pastor? Is that okay? Well, what do you guys think? Is that okay? Is that okay? Is that all right? Is that okay to do? I mean, your children are in children's ministry. They're receiving from somebody who's teaching them right now. Are you anything like me? Do you want them to be taught by somebody who loves the Lord? That, that's how I am. Am I judging somebody for drinking? No. You're missing my point if you, if you think that. What I'm saying is, do you think that going out partying on a Saturday night and teaching God's Word on Sunday is, is a good way to live? And the answer is, of course it isn't. There are, there are many... There, and this can sound, I have to be careful how I say it because not everybody in this room knows my heart. And you may be here for the first time and you may be thinking, oh, what a judgmental pastor, so be it. I mean, if, if, if you want to think that, there's nothing I can do about that. But like I said, I've been around for a while and I do have a concern for the body of Christ. And I do, this is the world I live in, the pastoral world. And I can tell you that there are many pastors who just want bodies in pews. They just want people to show up. They're willing to do almost anything to do so. I mentioned to you about the church that on Father's Day was offering beer to the guys if they show up for church. You guys show up, we'll give you a beer. Others don't even teach the Bible. They don't even, you don't even need the Bible in the church. You just show up and they'll give you current events because a lot of people want current events. They don't really want to know what the Bible has to say. They're not interested. They're not hungry. There's a, a, an enormous movement going on right now that is beneath the surface, but some are quite aware of it, called the emergent church movement, where the entire call in that basically is simple liberalism. It's not really teaching God's Word at all. It's, it's more social and it's more trying to do good works for people and get them to experience God. And they're willing to do almost anything to get people to, to quote-unquote experience God, but the problem is in their experience. They're not taking them through the Word of God because they don't value the Word of God. So they don't, te they don't teach the Bible. You don't need the Bible in the church. God, God weeps. God weeps. God weeps over that. God weeps over the, over the nation of Israel here. This lamentation is not from Ezekiel. This lamentation is from the heart of God. It's God who is weeping. And you say, how do you know that God weeps? Well, in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39, we have Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You were not willing. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. I say unto you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And I believe that he still weeps over the body of Christ. I gave you a statistic a while back. Perhaps some of you might remember it. A particular survey, survey that was done that discovered that atheists had a lower divorce rate than evangelical Christians. Atheists who don't even believe in God were more solid in their marriages than believers because what has happened for a lot of believers is we don't think God's serious about what he says in his word. And we've taken the word grace and we've said, well, we can extend that to do anything basically we want and we can still go to heaven. Now, I expect that in the world. You know, I expect that kind of thing in the world. You know, Farrah Fawcett Majors dies and everybody says she went to heaven. I mean, there's nobody who would say that, well, was she born again? Nobody even questions that. No, she went to heaven, everybody says. Michael Jackson? 
you name it. Any well-known person who dies, immediately they say, well, he or she is in heaven. And that's because that's how people think. Well, even the church thinks that way. Yet we're the ones who are supposed to teach people. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus himself said. I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. It's at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord. That's how you enter into heaven. You have to be born again. No, not today. No, today all you need to do to go to heaven is die. And you go to heaven, right? Everybody goes to heaven. Dogs go to heaven. I mean, I've had people upset because if you say that their dog's not going to go to heaven, they think that you're some kind of pagan. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, they ask, they ask it on Christian, Christian sh sh you know, answer, uh, answer shows that I've been on. Do dogs go to heaven? You know what Jesus said? Well, Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So if a dog is born again, does he become a cat? <laughs> That's a new creature. No, we, we really, really, because there is a famine for the Word of God, because people don't know this book. I mean, how much useless information do you have stored in your mind? I have got so much, it's unbelievable. Stanley, Stanley, Stanley Chevrolet, two blocks off the Santa Ana Freeway, 11980 East Firestone, Stanley Chevrolet. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? It's still right here. It won't go away. It's not even Stanley Chevrolet anymore. It's Dial Chevrolet. <laughs> I learned that when I was like eight years old. I've known that for 50 years. Why? I don't know. Can you sing the, the song for the Flintstones? <laughs> A lot of people can. The Beverly Hillbillies. So many shows that we heard and we grew up and they had little jingles that we memorized. And we have all kinds of information that rattles around in our brains that can come out in the weirdest moments. Like just now, Stanley Chevrolet. Why, oh Lord, why? So that tells me that I can remember things. It just depends on what I want to remember. That's what it tells me. I've turned on the radio and a song comes on that I haven't heard for 30 years. 30 years. And before you know it, I'm just repeating the words. I still remember them. 40 years. Sometimes 45 years. Goes all the way back, oh, to the 60s, 1963. Do you remember this? And I go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but why? I know the long version of Bob Dylan songs. Why? Because they rattle around in your memory. So we have a lot of things that have influenced us every day. Every day, some new thing is inserted into your memory banks. And every day, you're influenced. Every day. Every time you turn on the radio, every time you turn on your television set, every time you go to the movies, every day when you're driving on the freeway and you see that billboard, Spearmint Rhino or whatever, you seen it? I am telling you, we are filled with images and filled with information, except for the Word of God, except for the Word of God except for the Word of God. We know so much except for the most important things. Isn't that amazing, but it's true. Why is that? Well, because our world is fighting the things of God, and sometimes we, like dead fish, kind of float in the stream of the world, and God weeps, and God cries, and God says this is a lamentation because the things that don't matter, you care about. And the things that don't matter, 
Those are the things you care for. So you can use God's name in vain on any of the three major network channels. It's never bleeped out. But you better not say queer because that's a dirty word today, right? Nobody can say that word. Am I saying we should all go out and start yelling it? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is some words are taboo and the most important name in the universe where God says, I will not hold the man guiltless who taketh my name in vain. I will not hold him guiltless. That word goes over the air and nobody blinks. Nobody thinks that it's wrong. It's more wrong to use the N-word than it is the name of God in vain. And even cartoons will use the name of Jesus Christ in vain. And nobody cares. And that makes God weep because the church doesn't even blink anymore. We don't. It's just part of the society we live in. And the enemy is working overtime to destroy the faith. And God weeps. Lamentation. These kings did not follow the ways of God. And God weeps over that. Interestingly enough, it says in verse 14, so that she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. This speaks concerning the fact that from that time on, no true king from David's line would reign over Israel. But God did send a true king. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. But they didn't want him. He was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He came to his own domain, and his own people didn't receive him. They didn't want him. God sent his true king. They rejected him. But he is the king of Israel. He is of the line of David. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's also the lamb who was slain. They didn't receive their king but they will eventually. And we, we have received his king and we can worship him. I just pray, I just pray that we, that we with every, every beat of our heart, that we as believers will fight the inclination to give up and simply go with the flow. I, simply, I pray that God will give us the strength to remain firm in him because I'm telling you, the world does not give up. Satan does not give up. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to take away your hope. And it is a war. It's a war that every morning I wake up and I'm aware I'm going to fight. Every morning I wake up, I know it's time to put the helmet on. It's time, time to put the breastplate on. It's time to gird the loins. It's time to put on, on my feet the, the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's time to take that, that shield of faith, and it's time to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And it's time to invigorate that with prayer because we're going to war today. We're going into battle today, and I need to be ready. I need to be ready because the enemy's after me every day. Am I a paranoid? No, I'm prepared because I know that he's going to come after me today. Why? Because I made up my mind a long time ago because today is the day that I will serve the Lord. You see, he never goes after targets that aren't even difficult. He always goes after the most difficult ones. He goes after the ones who are saying, I'm going to make a battle out of this. And that's why, by the way, sometimes you have such tough days. 
it's because you woke up saying, today is the day that the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. Lord, I'm going to serve you today. And the enemy said, well, we'll see. We'll see how you do. And then you say, oh, I don't think it's worth it. And he said, ah, you wimp. <laughs> how hard was that? Gave you a headache, and before you know it, you don't think there's a God.